Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to pause for a bit as people um, come into the webinar today. Thank you for joining us today for our next edition of our 49er Industry Chat. My name is Noemi Guevara, and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at California State University, Long, Long Beach. Before we continue, just want to let you know this session is being recorded, and it will live on our website at um, csub.edu forward slash alumni for your future um, reference. Also, we encourage you to use our Q&A box located below to submit any questions throughout the chat today for our guest speaker. And now I'd like to introduce to the moderator for our chat, um, I would like to introduce Alana Tell Oren. Alana is an alum of the beach, graduated in 2011 with a degree in performance and currently is currently works as part of the alumni team um, at the beach. Thank you, Alana, for moderating the chat today. And now I pass it on over to you. Of course, thanks so much, Noemi. Um, so I'm here today to introduce uh, Sean Kubota. Um, Sean is a proud CSUB graduate earning his Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies and Interpersonal Communication. He is a financial coach, author, and entrepreneur. Uh, through his financial planning practice with Northwestern Mutual, he has been able to assist countless individuals in creating comprehensive financial plans towards achieving their goals and dreams. Uh, so please join us in welcoming today's 49er Industry Chat host, Sean Kubota. Yay. <laughs> so thanks so much for Thank being you. with us, Sean. Um, to just get started, um, would you like to share a bit about your Cal State Long Beach experience, how you chose Cal State Long Beach, and also how you got to uh, your current position today as well? Absolutely. I'd love to. Um, Cal State Long Beach was incredible. Um, absolutely amazing. The best experience of my life. Uh, you know, I lived in Beverly Plaza, you know, right near the beach. I, I biked to school every single day, um, used the shuttle as well. And, uh, you know, I went in there uh, initially for art. I was also a big part of the, um, the breakdancing club at beach. So I was actually breakdancing at Cal State Long Beach before I actually entered college. Um, from there, I ended up actually uh, diving into a communication studies course where I was able to create a, a speech, uh, an informative presentation, which I, you know, I found my passion right there and ended up really emphasizing in the public speaking courses at, at Long Beach and being really fascinated with um, just communication studies as a whole um, and found a lot of great family and, and longtime friends there. And um, that led me to where, I, where I'm at now, um, having the, the capacity to be able to help people learn uh, financial literacy, financial planning, something that I truly personally believe should be common knowledge um, and should be taught to us in our school system, which obviously isn't, but um, you know, it, it gives me the opportunity to be able to help people. And um, you know, I just, Beach has the biggest space in my heart and anyone who goes there, I know that they're getting one of the most incredible experiences, um, something that, you know, maybe we're biased, but I feel would surpass a, a UC experience or an Ivy League. So yeah, I, I love Beach, go Beach. Awesome. Yeah, go beach indeed. I definitely agree. Um, and the communication studies department here was so like tight knit as well. Um, so that's mm -hmm. great that you're able to, you know, start working in the field of your choice shortly after graduating. Um, so I understand you have a presentation for us, which I'm really excited to hear more about. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, and then for those of you who have questions, again, please use the Q&A box. And what we'll do is we'll have Sean go through his presentation and we will do our best to get through all of your questions a little bit toward the end of the presentation. So feel free to drop those in the Q&A uh, as Sean starts presenting. Okay, fantastic. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Well, you know, once again, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really honored to be able to share this information with you all. Um, you know, like Alana said, I'm a CSUB alumni from 2013. And, you know, I honestly cherished my time at Long Beach and wish I could do it again. Um, you know, since graduating, I worked in numerous industries, uh, including real estate investing, um, where I taught seminars on financial literacy. Um, and that's where I really was able to make this, you know, graceful pivot into doing what I do now. 
um, which is really being able to work with individuals on a very intimate and personal basis, um, understanding financial literacy, understanding what certain, you know, um, retirement accounts, things that are extremely basic yet um, without any understanding, we just kind of throw it to the wind because it's a little bit overwhelming, right? Um, so yeah, you know, that led me to becoming a financial coach and advisor with Northwestern Mutual. Um, you know, having a financial planning practice has allowed me to reconnect with a lot of alumni, which I'm really grateful for, um, as well as meet new friends and create new relationships. Um, just something I wanted to throw out there just because it's um, something that I, is really close to my heart and would maybe give you a little bit of an idea of what I do in the case that you may, uh, you may uh, be, you know, possibly, um, you know, doing this yourself someday. Uh, my average client relationship is on average, like going to be around 35 years in this industry. Um, one of the reasons why I bring that up is because if you're wanting to help people and you're wanting to make an impact on their lives and be able to be there for them and literally have their back through your whole adult life and their adult life, like I honestly can't think of anything that's more fulfilling. Um, and, and that's why I love what I do. So, um, you know, my goal today is to hopefully um, through what I, I covered today is, is help you feel a little bit more confident um, about your financial planning or at least your financial literacy as a whole, whether you're, um, you know, just getting out of school, starting to find your career or you're seasoned in the workforce. So today um, I want to talk about how to create a greater level of financial security and what that means. So what does that mean for us, right? Um, you know, I'd like to start by taking a poll. Um, you know, how many of us right now currently have a plan or, you know, a roadmap in place to reach our financial goals? I'm not sure if I can see anyone, um, but hopefully we have a lot of hands raised. Um, you know, for those of you who don't have a plan currently to achieve your financial goals, trust me, you're not alone. Um, however, we can all agree that anything great takes strategic planning, right? And an undertaking of preparation in order to come to fru uh, fruition, right? So, Having and building a financial plan is really the first step we can take uh, to making our dreams become a reality. So if you already have a financial plan, um, my question is how confident are you in this plan? Um, does it have all the right strategies to meet your goals? You know, what are those strategies? So my goal today is to help you get started or evolve your financial plan that's currently in place, um, provide a few juicy nuggets of info um, that will help you take advantage of, you know, and take your planning to the next level. So. Um, hopefully at the end of this, you'll be in a better position to achieve those goals. So let's get started. Um, these are the five action keys to creating financial security. So no matter how much, whoops, sorry about that. No matter how much um, money you make or how old you are, your plan to create a more secure financial future um, should include two, uh, these five strategies um, and using them wisely. So number one is saving, right? Obvious. Uh, number two is spending, which is the fun one. Um, number three is growth. Number four is protect, uh, one of the most important. And number five is give. So let's dive into each one in a little bit more detail, um, starting with save. So I'm sure you all understand the importance of saving, right? Um, building up savings today can help you live a comfortable life tomorrow. It's self explanatory. Um, the question is, are we on track? And that's something that a lot of us don't keep track of. It's a little bit overwhelming to think about. We don't really know where to start. So how many of us feel we're saving enough money to reach our financial goals. Now, unless we're seasoned in the workforce and we've possibly met with someone um, in my career path, uh, we probably don't really have a gauge on that. Um, so I'm assuming that most of us are just kind of getting our feet wet in this territory. Um, and that's totally okay. Um, you know, when you think about your saving for the future, um, whether it's saving for a new home or for your own retirement or college for your kids, um, which for some of us may be really far away, but trust me, it happens sooner than you think. Um, the best way to know if you're on track is to know with some level of certainty where the track is headed, right? So let's back up a bit. Um, think about what your future is going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 or 30 years, right? Um, things like where will we live, right? What will our family look like? Will we have kids? Will we have a spouse, et cetera? Um, what are the big purchases we want to make in the short term, right? Maybe a house. Um, what about the long term? You know, uh, do we want to have vacation houses? What, what does our lifestyle look like? Um, how will we spend our free time? Right. Will it be important for us to financially support causes that we believe in? Um, and a really big one. Will we be helping our parents and or other family members, siblings financially in the future? Possibly. Right. Um, something to really think about. So, you know, on a piece of paper or on your phone or you're on your computer, um, what I'd love you to do is just write down your top three goals for the future, 
So let's talk like a short-term goal. That's like two to three years, right? A goal you have for five years, as, the, as well as like a goal 10 years from now, a long-term goal that could be maybe a retirement goal, right? And be specific um, because unless you get detailed about your goals, you really won't know over time whether you're financially on track to meet them and you won't know exactly how much you should possibly be saving for this, right? Um, and if you're married, talk about your goals for uh, your future together with your spouse. Um, make sure that you're on the same page about your priorities. Um, it's one of the aspects I love about what I do uh, that's really fulfilling is that sometimes just finding the time to sit down and answer these questions makes all the difference um, and really helps us to figure out what we individually or collectively um, really want to have happen. Um, it's often overlooked in the day-to-day and you know, we don't want to be a ship floating out to sea with no direction. We, we have to have intention, right? Um, where to steer, uh, know where we're going in order to get there. So um, the question is, how much should we be putting away in savings and investing in investments, right? Um, generally speaking, uh, you should allocate about 20% of your income to savings. Oftentimes, I like to put 25 towards that. But, you know, in reality, the amount you should be saving really depends on the goals we just talked about. Right. So it could definitely be a higher percentage. Um, an easy way to boost your every year. Um, so when you get your annual salary adjustment or bonus, increase your savings by just one percent. Um, your wallet won't feel it, but um, your savings account will benefit. So in terms of where to save your money, everyone's situation is very unique. Um, you know, generally speaking, the key is to break down your savings into time horizons. Um, when will you actually need to use the money? Right. So for short term, um, you know, our goals that are over the next two to three years, like a down payment on a home or a new car, um, saving for those in a high yield savings account, along with your emergency fund, um, that's where we would normally place those, typically because you're going to want to have a higher rate of return than a regular bank savings account, which would usually be around like 0.001, whereas online high yield savings accounts or at a credit union, um, you could get anywhere from 0.5 to 1%. Um, some summer savers accounts via schools even get you like 2.5. Um, the reason for these accounts specifically is because of stability as well as liquidity, meaning they're not going to be rising and falling with the tide of the stock market, and they're very easily accessible to retrieve, um, aka you don't want to have to go and retrieve that money and find out that it's gone down 50%, right? So we kind of sacrifice on gains, um, but what we do get in return is stability, right? So uh, for midterm, uh, midterm goals, midterm money, which is, you know, anywhere from like five to 10 years or so. Um, this is where you might want to put money into the market. You know, um, this is to, to make that simple. That's like an investment account or a brokerage account, the stock market. Um, you know, this is where we want to put our money for growth, um, especially growth that surpasses inflation, right? We have a hefty inflation rate in America right now. Um, and in order to beat that, we're not really going to do that in a high yield savings account, but we can do that in the market. Um, Something to keep in mind is this is where our tax liability is completely present. So that means that we're taxed on, you know, what we take out and, and our capital gains, whether that's long term or short term. Right. But that's completely necessary for all of our goals that are previous to retirement age, which would be 59 and a half, a.k.a. 60 to make it easy. Um, so for our long term goals that aren't necessarily retirement, but are quite a bit in the future, um, we want to be as tax efficient as possible. So you might want to consider an annuity or, you know, life insurance is also a good option. Um, something that a lot of people don't know, but unlike ordinary term life insurance that we usually think about, um, permanent life insurance actually accumulates cash value that grows tax deferred unattached to the stock market, meaning that when the stock market plummets, the interest rate on this cash value remains positive. Um, so this provides a bucket of tax deferred liquid safe money. Um, that grows at a much higher rate of return than any high yield savings account, um, yet also has the liquidity of a savings account um, and also can benefit us if something were to happen to us, right, to protect our family. Um, you know, we can ultimately use this as an alternative strategy towards retirement for distribution, you know, if and when the market does take a downturn. Um, and then finally, retirement. So for this very important goal, we want to be directing our money into qualified retirement vehicles, such as 401k, traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs or an annuity. For some of us in the school system, our 401k might be a 403b. For those of us who are in the government, it might be like 457. Um, those are, all of those have specific tax strategies that are given to us by the government um, because we're pledging that we're going to use them later on in life after 59 and a half. If we choose to take them before that, we're going to get a 10% penalty. It's 
not going to be good. So those are specific for we're putting that stuff in for the long term. We don't touch it. We want to make it grow. Um, a quick note about 401ks, because I know that a lot of us might be changing jobs often after we're coming out of college. Um, if you do uh, and you participated in your previous employer's 401k, um, obviously you're going to have to decide what to do with that money, right? And if you were me, you were probably like, hey, it's my money. I'm going to take it out immediately. Um, keep in mind, 401ks get special tax treatment. And because of that, you also get a penalty if you don't take advantage of that tax treatment, right? So just like I said, um, if you take this out before you're 59 and a half, you're going to get a 10% penalty on top of everything else, um, your, your ordinary income tax as well. So you're going to get taxed heavily. Um, so the options that you have is you could leave the balance where it is if you're happy with the plan's performance and your old empower, employer allows it, right? Um, you could roll it into your new employer's plan. Um, which is very simple and shouldn't cost you anything. Um, you could also roll it over into a traditional IRA, aka an individual retirement account, which is what I usually tend to do with my clients, um, considering there's a greater range of investment options that are available within an IRA. Um, it also allows for us to utilize it to fund a Roth IRA, um, you know, later down the, not the line or immediately. Um, just to hit on that really quick, a Roth IRA is completely tax-free, but it has a cap as to what income you can make. Um, as well as how much you can put in it a month. But that is one of the juiciest um, you know, retirement vehicles that our government offers us, um, but it does have some stipulations. And obviously the last option, like I said, is that we could cash out, but I know that we might be tempted to do that because you know, we might be in a pinch or you know, as we're coming out of college, we might be kind of living in a month to month basis. But you know, keep in mind that when we pull out that money, it might look like a lot, all of the taxes and penalties are going to just devour the balance. So, um, you know, we're going to lose some momentum towards retirement. So keeping it in there might just be a better option um, or rolling it over, something like that. Um, there's a lot to consider, obviously, when it comes to retirement. Um, aside from how we invest, we want to make sure that we have distribution strategies as well. So this can mean the difference of hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars kept or given to the government, um, which I know doesn't really make sense, but um, it's the, it's the truth. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stress it enough is that, um, having a variety of distribution strategies when we get to retirement, not just having everything in a 401k, not just having everything in a Roth, having a variety of distribution strategies at our disposal allows for us to have the least amount of tax liability and also can save us a lot, a lot of money later on down the line. So that's where having a strategic plan really comes in handy. So, um, that's a little bit on save. Next up is spend. So I'm sure a lot of us feel we're already good at this one. Um, but when I mention spend, I mean specifically planning and managing our expenses, right? So um, by spending wisely, we can afford the things that we need, efficiently manage our debt like student loans, credit cards, um, and still have money for what we want. So oftentimes, we just need that structure and retainer to understand what we can and cannot spend. And um, if you're a spender by nature, like I am, um, just something to throw out there, you know, oftentimes savers or sorry, spenders make the best savers they just need to know what to spend on, <laughs> what, to, what, what savings account to spend on and so forth. So food for thought, you know, everyone has the possibility of becoming a good saver. Um, so, you know, spending wisely uh, is really about knowing what money is coming in and what's going out, right? So you probably all know what a budget or what we like to call a spending plan is. Um, you know, it's extremely key to understanding your finances and also knowing exactly what you can be spending every month and where you might be able to optimize, right? So there's all kinds of online tools available like Mint. Um, many of you are probably familiar with that one. Um, Northwestern Mutual has um, a tracking tool for our clients that aggregates expenses and helps you see your full financial picture um, so you can make those needed adjustments. Um, and I also have a budget worksheet. Uh, if any of you want to get in touch with me later, I'm more than happy to email that over to you. Um, so once you've evaluated your expenses for a few months, you'll be able to get you know, an idea of what's going in and what's going out. Um, if you don't like what you see or your debt bucket is a lot bigger than what is recommended, which should be like no more than 35% of your income, you might need to make some changes. Um, I know it's tough. A lot of us, you know, like to spend a lot on discretionary expenses like Postmates, Grubhub, you know, extraneous subscriptions, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, all of those. It can make a really big impact on our budget and it could also free up some space for us to save, right? Um, so we could use that money that we would spend to spend on saving. Um, another option is to free up money you can put towards savings uh, as far as debt goes, right? Um, so this is being smarter about our debt. Um, if you have some debt and manage it responsibly, 
um, you know, you can free up some money and, and get ahead financially. Um, so that's why you often hear people say not all debt is created equal. Um, credit card debt is an example of bad debt because the interest rates are usually typically very high, over 20%. Um, so credit card debt is one of the first things we want to take care of, um, especially when we're developing a debt management strategy. Uh, the goal should be to pay off all credit card debt within five years, hopefully sooner. Uh, always make at least the minimum monthly payment on your credit card bills. Honestly, I would say pay a little bit more, um, you know, starting with your credit card that has the highest interest rate. Uh, this will help you pay your credit card debt down faster. Obviously, there's a caveat to that. If there's one card that just has an extremely high balance, your minimum payment on that will be very high. So you might want to tackle that one, even if it does have a lower interest rate. But rule of thumb is usually the one with the highest interest rate. Uh, by taking these steps over the long run, you'll save money and also free up some space within your monthly budget in order to use towards your other goals, whether that be, um, you know, saving for your emergency fund or putting in towards growth, towards a home, et cetera, or towards your retirement. Um, a couple of notes that I wanted to make on credit that are often somewhat hidden and untaught and a lot of us don't know, and we don't really know that we've made that mistake unless it happens to us. So keeping a credit card at a zero balance is not good. <laughs> for months on end, having a credit card balance at zero can actually close your account. Um, so not having anything on there is actually detrimental and could actually harm your credit because that could stay on record for anywhere from like two to five years. Um, also, if you have bad credit and you do want to repair it, um, consider going to a bank that offers secured credit cards, which essentially act as like a prepaid gift card. So you put money forward um, and then you use it. And what happens is that whole process uh, is reported to the um, credit bureau, which allows for you to repair your credit. Um, the sweet spot of where you want to have your credit balance is anywhere from like five to 10, sometimes like 15, even 20%, you don't want to have more than 30. So once you have more than 30% used in your available balance, to make that in perspective, if you had $1,000 on your available balance on a credit card and you were spending more than 300 on there and having that balance carried, that would be seen as unfavorable. If it's below that, you're in the green. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, moving forward, student loan debt. So any of us who have student loans from, um, I should move this a little bit, from Cal State Long Beach, Student loan debt is great, and you went to an amazing school, the best school in the world, in my opinion. So um, this is considered to be an investment in yourself. So it is more like leverage than debt, right? There's so much you can do with this, um, and we didn't just blow it on some nice clothes or, you know, um, subscriptions, right? So the expectation is that this investment will pay for itself many times over your lifetime. Um, better opportunities, higher income, right? So still, if you feel buried under the weight of your student loans, like I get it. Um, there's some things to consider that may be of help. For one, if you have federal loans, you can always change your repayment plan at any time for free. Right now you're in forbearance, which is great. You have a breather, um, but you also might be able to chunk that down a little bit this year. Um, there are a few other options that might be available as well. First one is uh, student loan forgiveness. Um, this can really help if you're uh, in a position where you're in public service, so public service loan forgiveness, as well as teacher loan forgiveness. In both cases, you can have your loan balance forgiven if you meet certain criteria. Usually, you have to work a minimum of 10 years in that industry, right, consecutively. Uh, you may also be able to consolidate your loans and refinance. Um, in this case, you'd work with a bank, credit union, or lending agency um, and take out a new loan to pay off your old one. Um, and if your credit is better now, um, you might be able to get a lower interest rate, et cetera, um, so it might be something good to consider. Uh, now, a mortgage, not sure how many of us who are on this call have a mortgage, but a mortgage is generally considered good debt um, for a couple of reasons. For one, you're building equity in something that will hopefully grow in value and appreciate over time. Um, also, you might be getting tax deductions for the interest, property taxes, and also depreciation. Um, so something uh, that I want to point out is that when we're first home buyers and when we're starting to possibly have a spouse and have kids, we're actually having a lot of write-offs there and deductions, um, whether that be the depreciation, interest rate, property taxes that we're paying on our house, having dependents, also being married. Later on in life, oftentimes people think they'll be at a lower um, tax liability, but after our kids are out of the house, after our house is paid off and depreciated, um, you know, besides being in a, uh, a marriage and filing jointly, we actually have more tax liability later on in life, which is something to consider when we're thinking about um, tax deferred or tax free retirement vehicles, right? Um, anyways, you know, some people would want to give up deductions if it meant they could get from out from under their mortgages more quickly. So if you're thinking about this, um, what I would make sure that you do is make sure that you've eliminated credit card debt first 
and have any other debt under control. Um, and then you have a couple options. First, obviously, is refinancing. I'm pretty sure a lot of us understand what this means, but um, you know, if we're locked into a long-term mortgage like a 30-year refinancing is great, especially, you know, interest rates are starting to rise now, but um, all of last year we were having a really low interest rates. So a lot of people were refinancing and essentially um, getting a new um, mortgage uh, at a lower interest rate, right? Um, another really great opportunity, especially when we have a decent amount of money to throw towards our mortgage, um, what we want to do is we want to chunk down principal and solely principal. So this is something that you would have to make sure that your um, lending company is willing to accept. Um, but unless you make the stipulation that you want to pay down the principal specifically, you will just consistently be paying down the interest first. So oftentimes people aren't aware of this, but you know, over the life of a mortgage, you might be paying way more than what you're expecting to just because of the fact that the interest is being paid before you ever touch the principal. So being able to chunk off some of that principal um, is, is a fantastic idea. So once again, um, you have to make sure that your lender allows for you to make early repayment um, on the principal, but I recommend talking to your tax accountant as well on any impact that that might have towards your tax deductions. So um, lastly, keep in mind that refinancing or paying extra means that you might not have easy access to your funds um, as they're tied up in your real estate. Um, so that's also why it's an option to have only if you have your other debt under control, right? So I know we've covered a lot of ground in the spend section. Um, I have a lot of material that uh, I can make available to you later on, um, a budget worksheet, guides on credit scores, managing student loan debt. So if any of you are interested in that, I'm more than happy to share that with you. Um, so moving forward, um, how many of you currently invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, crypto, right? Um, you know, whether you're a seasoned investor or someone who's just relatively new to investing, making investment choices that are right for you is based largely on the way that you answer three questions. So let's take a minute to go through these. Um, start by listing, you know, what your goal is. Are you saving for a car? Are you saving for a house, college, retirement, you know, a PS5? I don't know. I don't know. You know, it, it's whatever it is, right? Um, how much risk are you willing to take with your money, right? How comfortable are you with the market? Um, swings, the volatility, uh, the possibility that when you need it, it might be worth a lot less than what it was before, right? That's called your risk tolerance. So how risk adverse are you or, or how willing are you to take on risk? Um, the second is how many years do you have to invest before your money is needed, aka our time horizon, what we talked about earlier, right? Um, the longer your time horizon, the more you're willing to handle those swings and the more that you'll be able to, you know, be willing to have that volatility because you're not really going to be needing it until a, a longer time horizon. And then once the market does recover, you might be able to put it in somewhat of a more conservative investment um, in order to lock in those gains. So, <clears throat> you know, take a minute to jot down any of your answers on your phone, computer, or on a piece of paper. And moving forward, what I would implore all of you to do is when it comes to growing your money, make sure that your investments reflect your goals your risk tolerance, and your timeline. This is how we can be very accurate and intentional about how we're investing our money and how we can make sure that we actually reach our goals, right? Um, so while your investment strategy, you know, will be specific to your situation, you want to plan to include a variety of investment types, um, something that we call asset allocation, right? Um, obviously, there's a lot of wisdom in the old adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I honestly used to think that line was so cheesy now that I'm older, it is absolutely true. <laughs> and um, hopefully, hopefully you can trust me on that. Um, you know, every year there are investments that do really, really well. Um, and it's very easy to get into the, the hype of our friends and people who are reaffirming that, oh, this is a good one. Um, but then there are some that don't do well. And some of the ones that don't do well this year did really well the year before. The trouble is, you just really don't know who are going to be the big winners and losers ahead of time. You know, we don't have Captain Foresight built into us, right? We're always Captain Hindsight. We're rarely Captain Foresight. So it's really important for us to spread our investments um, out across different asset classes. Um, of course, that means all of our investments aren't going to be the best performers every year, but the point is that they're not going to be the biggest losers every year, right? Um, and that's the sacrifice we have to take in order to make sure that we actually are going to reach our goals rather than just hedging, you know, or hedging our bets and possibly not reaching them. You know, uh, We want to make sure that we're doing our, our most accurate and intentional um, investment decisions so that we can actually attain those goals, right? If it is something that we truly want to make happen. So, you know, the strategies behind asset allocation get pretty complicated. Um, so when you're making investment choices, like 
speak to a financial professional who can help steer you in the right direction. Um, you know, given once again, your time horizon, uh, your intention and your risk tolerance. So we've covered save, we've covered spend and we've covered grow. Now let's move on to protect, right? So take a look at the goals that you've written down. Um, chances are they take money to achieve, right? So for most of us, that money will come from our paychecks. Um, now, what would happen to those goals if something unfortunate happened to us and we couldn't work or if we passed away, right? Of course, this is not the kind of thing that any of us want to think about. Um, but let's face it, the life that we envision for ourselves, for our family, is based on us being able to earn what we're earning now and what we expect to earn in the future, right? I mean, that's, that's just the reality. So imagine what would happen if we lost that power to earn our income. Um, so there's three basic threats to our long-term ability to earn and protect our income. The first is disability, second is long-term care, and the third is death. So first is disability. Um, you know, most people don't realize how easy it is to become sick or injured to the point where you can't work. Um, the fact is one in four people will be disabled at some point in their career. And what that means is like most disabilities are caused by relatively common occurrences like back problems, pregnancy complications, cancer, heart attack, stroke, and honestly, a lot of them from mental health. So one of the stipulations that I have to make very present for a lot of people and what really, you know, completely shook my mind is that, um, you know, I always thought of disability and disability insurance having to do with the paraplegic symbol on a, a disability placard and thinking like, I don't want to envision that happening to me. I don't see that, foresee that happening to me. For one, it does happen in around 10% of cases. Um, but most of the uses for disability income insurance actually happen because of the fact that, uh, you know, there's some sort of mental health event or we have back problems or pregnancy complications, like very, very common things, right? That's why one in four people will actually have an event within their working life where they actually are unable to work, oftentimes on average of two years. So many of you probably have disability income insurance uh, because it's included in your benefits at work if you're a W-2. Um, most of you probably don't know much more beyond that. And that's totally fine because no one does. So uh, to inform you a little bit about that, it has a cap. Um, usually it's about 60% of your income pre-tax. So after tax, it could look something more around like 40%, right? Which is a pretty big gap considering most of us have pretty high expenses, especially if we're living in SoCal. Um, so what that means is that, you know, we have to ask the question, you know, everyone like, well, let's do this. If you can, everyone write down your monthly take-home income that you bring home every month and then calculate how much you'd get if you only got 40% of your monthly salary every month, right? So the question is, could you pay your bills? Um, could you take care of the people that you love? And more importantly, could you save for the future for things that matter most to you, right? Because a period of two years is a very long time to, for one, not be making enough income, but two, not to save, not to be putting towards our compounding. Um, and especially with inflation rates the way they are, we're going to need to be compounding and using our time right now before we get to retirement to grow that money as much as we can, even if we're not making as high of an income. We're going to need to grow that and we need to put it to work for us so that once we get there, we can feel good about what we've done and be able to live the lifestyle that we want to live, right? Um, moreover than that, the caveat is that our employer paid benefit, although free to us, only lasts for two years. So if we're unable to work for longer than that, we will not be able to get any more income insurance after that. So that 40% goes away. Um, luckily, individual disability income insurance can close the gap um, and at least get us to around 85 to 80% of our income. Um, honestly, it's one of the most affordable insurances you can get to help you cover your most important asset, which is your income, right? Um, plus, unlike employer paid disability insurance, um, individual disability can pay out way past two years to age 70 and beyond. Um, something to keep in mind is that it's not just for full-time workers as well. Um, Part-time workers, um, stay-at-home moms can get coverage to help cover the cost of the contributions they make to the family. Um, entrepreneurs, independent contractors, business owners who are oftentimes completely uninsured can get coverage as well as there's specific coverage to meet the needs of physicians and dentists as well that are very unique to them. So what I wanted to say is coming from a dental family, I can say from my own experience how powerful this tool of disability income insurance is. Um, my uncle, who was a cosmetic dentist, got a massive heart attack at the age of 45 and had to get heart surgery, open heart surgery. Um, he's been paid 80% uh, of his salary by his policy for the past 25 years, right? He would have lost his house um, everything he had without it. So the question remains not can we afford it, but can we afford not to have it? Food for thought, right? Um, moving forward, when we talk about protecting our income, we also need to think about life insurance, right? 
as with disability income insurance, you probably have a little bit from your work as far as life insurance goes, maybe like two times your salary. The question is, is it enough to replace our income that we make over the next 30 years, right? So for some of us who have spouses, for some of us who have kids, you know, if we're making a moderate income, we might be making somewhere around like $2 million to like $5 million over the next 30 years. How do we replace that, right? To self-insure that, we, we wouldn't, it, it's, it's unfeasible. So the things to think about when we're talking about like, you know, what could happen if we were gone is like, does our spouse and our, our need help to pay the mortgage, you know? daily living expenses to take care of our kids? Do we need, you know, family child care funding, right? Um, are there debts and student loans that would fall onto our spouse and family? Oh, sorry, let me move this forward. Um, will we be able to fund our child's college and education, right? Um, do we want to leave a legacy for our children, um, provide for their wedding, possibly help them with a down payment on a house? Um, do we expect to support our parents, um, you know, our kids, family members in the future? And do we want to leave an inheritance to our children and grandchildren, right? So these are really important topics to consider. Um, many insurance options are available, some of which we can take advantage of while we're still alive as a financial a tool towards our growth and retirement, um, such as permanent insurance, like I talked about earlier. Uh, so while we're talking about the concept of protecting against the unexpected, we have to mention long-term care. Now, how many of you are currently providing care to a loved one or have done so in the past? I can't see you, but if any of you have your hand raised, my heart goes out to you. Um, you know, if you know someone who is or, or you've seen firsthand the toll it can take both emotionally and financially, um, you know, it is, it is tremendous. Um, as you get older, the chances, chances are, you know, much greater that you're going to be impacted. Uh, the fact is right now, someone turning 65 has an almost 70% chance of eventually needing some kind of long-term care. Um, many people think that you know, if something happens, the cost of long-term care is going to be covered by Medicare or Medicaid um, or private health insurance. Not the case. Um, so as you can see from this chart, the increasing costs for long-term care are staggering, uh, so much so that we've identified them as one of the biggest risks to running out of money in retirement. And like, it gives me chills. Like, let me say that again. It's the biggest risk to running out of money in retirement. So as you think about your financial future, please consider the possibility that you make sure you have a plan in place to cover long-term care expenses, not only for yourself, but for your, your loved ones, your parents, right? Um, and think about how you might be impacted if you don't. I can attest to this firsthand. Um, I had, was previously a full-time caregiver for my 95 and 92-year-old grandparents for two years, right? Um, it was the most emotionally and physically exhausting experience of my life. Um, sorry, I'm getting an Amber alert right now. Um, but, you know, I had to walk away from my own health uh, my own mental health and my own career. Um, now my family has two private caregivers. Just to give you an idea of how much we pay them every year, it's about 150K um, for caregiving alone, not considering extraneous expenses. So something that we want to keep in mind uh, with inflation, you know, at the age of 60 plus, long-term care could, you know, cost us anywhere from 300K to half a million dollars. So we want to make sure that we hedge for that and make sure that we're taking um, the best precautions for that. That way we can make sure that our family as well as ourselves are taken care of. Um, now we've reached our fifth and final strategy, which is to give. Um, in other words, where would you like to make a difference, right? You know, what, what, what type of um, causes matter most to you? What type of purposes, people would you like to support? Fundraisers, scholarships, other causes? Cal State Long Beach, wink, wink, right? So, you know, where do we want to be philanthropic? Where do we want to, um, what type of legacy do we want to put into the world, right? Our imprint. So with your own time and money, it's easier to support others in need, whether you want to help those to home or, you know, outside of your immediate circle. So if time's what you have to offer, you could take a few hours to volunteer, um, maybe volunteer for Cal State Long Beach alumni um, or, you know, help over, abroad. Um, and if your passion is to be able to provide something with a bigger price tag, you can think long-term, you know, save for a scholarship, Nonprofit organization, um, charitable contributions are tax deductible, by the way. So save your receipts or take a snapshot with your phone because they can help you during tax season. Um, so there you have it. Uh, five key actions for creating a lifetime of financial security. Save, spend, grow, protect, and give. So um, these five considerations apply no matter how much money you have right now, um, what your goals are for the future, where you are in life. So um, creating financial security is an ongoing process and it evolves as your life evolves. Um, you know, you might pay more attention to one this year and another the next, um, but the ultimate goal is to strike a balance between the five. So, you know, I really hope that you leave today inspired to work with someone to help 
either start financial planning or strengthen a plan you may already have in place. Um, as you do, know that your circumstances and your priorities are going to change over time, which is natural, and your financial plan will evolve as well. So um, before we wrap things up, I would just love if you guys could just like write down just as like an accountability measure, just like write down something that not in the future, but literally within the next two weeks that you can do to create a greater level of financial security within your and your family's lives. Um, there's no better time than right now to move forward and get confident about your financial future. So thank you all for coming. Um, this concludes my presentation. You know, I'm more than happy to talk to any of you further at a later time to answer any questions. But, um, you know, if you'd like to reach out, my number's on the screen. And uh, I'll hand the mic back to Alana. I think we hopefully have some time for Q&A. So thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Sean, for all of that information. Um, we did get a few questions in the chat. So in our last five minutes, I'd love uh, if you could address some of those. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, first, uh, is there a minimum amount to open a high-yield savings? No, no, not at all. Actually, one of the um, there are two that I would um, that I often you know recommend to my clients. Uh, one is Aspiration, so you can go to Aspiration or, or Google that. Um, they offer up to one percent in their high-yield savings account, um, up to ten k. After that, it goes way down, but one percent up to ten k. Another great one is called Ally Bank. Um, they give around 05 percent. Great. Okay. And uh, what strategy or planning would you implement with stagnant wages and unemployment that are currently rampant? Mm, okay. Can you can you say that question one more time? What strategy or planning would you implement mm -hmm. with stagnant wages and unemployment that are currently rampant? Okay. Gotcha. So yeah. I'm, from what it sounds like, we're not talking about an actual individual. We're talking about just in general. Um, yeah. stagnant wages and unemployment. Gotcha. So one of the first things that I would say, number one, everything is extremely specific to each individual. Um, one of the first things, and you know, I love being able to show this, this presentation because it goes over a lot of the juicy subjects first, but the first thing that I do in my, um, you know, when I'm talking to my clients is talk about how we can protect, right? You know, specifically for circumstances like what happened last year right? Um, so many friends laid off, so many people not knowing exactly what's going on in the world. We still really don't know what's going on in the world. Um, being able to create an emergency fund for ourselves um, is extremely important. Um, one of the things that we like to do is make sure that we have three months of our expenses. So let's say our burn rate every month is about $3,000. What we're going to want to do is save at least $9,000 into a high yield savings account. Now, if we can get to six months, that's even better. But the reason why we need that three months is specifically because of the fact that you know, obviously we have unemployment at our disposal, so at least we can get some sort of funds. But, you know, that three months can give us a little bit of three month float time until we actually receive those funds from EDD. But most importantly, the reason why we need that three month, um, you know, float period is because of the fact that let's say something goes beyond unemployment and we're actually working um, and we can't work for whatever reason. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe the world has just got us in such a bad place that we cannot work, right? Or we lose a loved one, a spouse, a, you know, family member. Um, in order to receive our disability income insurance benefits, we actually have to wait a period of 90 days, which a lot of people don't know. So all of a sudden they can't work and they're like, okay, I'm, I am absolutely not able to work. Where's this coverage? Oh, you have to have an elimination period of 90 days. So what ends up happening is that people go into debt, they end up taking out personal loans, or they end up liquidating their retirement or their savings, which is something that neither of those would want to do, which is why we want to have an emergency fund of our you know, of liquid cash in a high yield, not going to surpass inflation, but at least it's something that's growing more than our savings account. Definitely don't keep money in a checking account because it's not growing at all. In a savings account, you're going to get around 0.001%. In a high yield, you'll get 0.5 to 1, like I said, right? Um, but that's one of the first steps that we should all be taking is at least getting ourselves there. And, you know, if we're at a W-2 job, being able to supplement our disability to make sure that we get it up to 80 to 85% because I'm most likely certain that if we're working our tail off and, you know, we're working at a, in a, you know, a lower stagnant wage position, um, that 40% of our income is not going to cut it. Um, secondly, one thing to point out is that if we are receiving EDD, we're not going to be able to do certain things like apply for disability, obviously, because we're not employed currently. Um, one of the things that I would say is unemployment can hopefully help for us to either get a head start, um, you know, with either studying towards some other type of occupation, right? Um, the good thing is, you know, in that instance, you're able to have a little bit of time to float, possibly to 
you know, create your own business, possibly to take some free classes online. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of tools that we can use at our disposal, Udemy, different certifications we can hopefully get during that time of, um, you know, possibly not having work, but still at least hopefully getting to cover ourselves within, um, within that period of time. Um, but yeah, ultimately where it starts, where all planning starts is in the protect region, right? Because we need to protect ourselves from times like this. Um, so yeah, that, that would, I guess, be my answer. But if you, whoever said that, if you'd like to talk further, I'm more than happy to share any type of insight later on down the line. Great. Uh, thanks, Sean. And um, I know we're coming up on the time here, but uh, maybe just one more question. Um, Uh, so how did you get involved with your current position? What type of schooling was geared toward this career? Um, did you need any special certifications or licenses to work in your industry? Great question. So for any of you who are interested in possibly, um, you know, choosing this career path, what I can say is that it is one of the most, if not the most rewarding and fulfilling thing um, that is out there in the ability to be able to help people in a very vulnerable space and also being able to form a relationship with them if you're a pe people person. Um, at the same time, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult in the sense that, um, you know, imagine uh, something that is even more vulnerable than in some cases the human body, right? So, you know, being able to handle um, people, you know, possibly getting a little bit weird on you because talking about finances is, is a little bit of a, a difficult thing for some people. But you know, the reward that you're able to get with being able to actually hold that space for people who are really good people and you truly care about is just, there's nothing better. Um, to answer the question specifically, sorry, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, if you've been uh, an alumni of Cal State Long Beach, you're pretty much prepped. So in order for us to take on, uh, and even if you're in Cal State Long Beach currently, we have an amazing, literally the number one internship program in the country. Um, but uh, if you are an alumni and you have a, uh, you know, a, a bachelor's level degree, um, you're more than welcome to um, get interviewed by our staff. I'd be more than happy to introduce you to our team. Um, you know, as you go into the business, uh, you will need to become licensed and certified in order to uh, be able to be a fully functional um, advisor and planner. And those are things that just come with time. Um, but you have a whole host of, of the most amazing support system and, and team members that you can work with along your path that help for you to, uh, to make the whole process really streamlined and, and yeah. So ultimately, anyone who's on this call, you probably are already, <laughs> you're already prepared. So if it's something that you'd like to explore, I'm more than happy to help. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sean. Let me just um, absolutely share my screen here. Okay, great. So thank you very much for your time, Sean, and for a super informative industry chat today. Um, you saw Sean's number. Hopefully you took that down if you have any questions for him. Um, you can also email us at alumni at csulb.edu if you have any questions you'd like us to forward to Sean as well. Um, as a reminder, this chat was recorded and it will be live on our website within the next few days as well. So you can uh, rewatch all of that um, information. And uh, you have our website here and our social media handle. So once again, thank you so much for joining us and hope you all have a great rest of your day.